Hello, Wayne County Community College students. Dr. Morrison here. Today we're going to get into Chapter 4, a survey of prokaryotic cells and microorganisms, okay? First question, though, I have to you is, what is life? I want you to think about that, ponder it for a couple of seconds, and tell me what you think life is. What is life? Okay, now that you've thought about it, let's go in and see what the text says. So, it's no single property ultimately defines life. In other words, it's a collection of behaviors and properties will be better suited for a definition of life. First, you need a cell, right? I've drawn a cell here, and that's a prokaryotic cell, and you already know that prokaryotic cells are lacking what? Correct, they lack a nucleus, they do not have a nucleus. And when we think about prokaryotic cells, we definitely think of bacteria, right? Okay, good. So first you need a cell to even consider life, right? And a cell is a self-contained staging unit to carry out the activities of life. And you know, we're made of trillions of cells, correct? But we're not prokaryotes, so let me just stick with that. We're eukaryotes, so remember that. On your text, in your text, we have some things that will define life, such as heredity, uh, re the ability to reproduce, the ability to grow, have development, a metabolism, um, to have some type of responsiveness, and the ability of that cell to transport. These are all also included in this life list is self-regulation and evolutionary change. In your text, we'll say heredity. This would be, of course, the transmission of your genome, of some type of genetic material that could carry on to the next generation by chromosome, by chromosomes that would carry DNA. Reproduction, of course, involves the generation of offspring necessary to continue the species line of evolution. Um, growth has two general meanings in micro. In the usual sense, it means an increase in the size of a population through reproduction and in another case, it refers to the enlargement of the single organism during maturation. Development includes all changes over a lifespan of the organism that complete the full expression of its genome. Metabolism. Metabolism encompasses the thousands of chemical interactions that all cells need to function usually using enzymes to help this function, this function occur. Responsiveness. Responsiveness is the ca capacity of the cells to interact with external factors through irritability, communication, or movement. And then transport. Transport is a system for controlling the flow of materials. This includes carrying nutrients and water from the external environment into the cell's interior. And we also round that up, or round it out, by saying self-regulation and evolutionary change is also important in what is a definition of life. Now I'm gonna veer here and talk a little bit about viruses. Why? Because viruses are not considered alive. They're usually considered non-living because they do not have cells. And we just said in order to have life, you have to have a cell, right? Viruses don't have cells. They are dependent on a living host cell to carry out their functions. Unlike cells that contain both DNA and RNA, viruses contain either DNA or RNA but not both. Viruses possess only the genes needed to invade the host cells and then redirect that host cell's activity to make new viruses. So when we talk about viruses, 
will have to talk about viruses in terms of being inactive or active, not alive or dead. So viruses can be active and viruses can be inactive. But remember, they must have a host in order to be uh, active. And their job is to infect hosts, the host. With that being said, let's look at this prokaryotic cell. We're going back to what life is. In this prokaryotic cell, let's start here. You can see that this is all cytoplasm. Cytoplasm is a complex solution. It's a site for the cell's biochemical and synthetic activity. 70 to 80% of the cytoplasm is water. And this water in the cytoplasm, or the cytoplasm itself, helps uh, serve as a solvent. Here you see a bunch of circles, but really those represent the chromosomes. This is the DNA, or the nucleoid, of a prokaryotic cell. Please note that the DNA is not enclosed, but rather huddled together in the center of the cell. Here we have these three little ribosomes, but you have a lot more ribosomes than that in a prokaryotic cell. Ribosomes are made of RNA and protein. Our RNA and protein. 60%, 40% protein, 60% our RNA. This comes out to be about what we call for ribosomes a 70S, 70S. And we'll talk about the ribosomes of prokaryotes being uh, a 70S uh, as we progress. And then we'll compare it to eukaryotes being 80S. And you'll see why that's going to be important for the number, uh, that this, the unit that these ribosomes uh, represent. Say, for example, this prokaryotic cell is an endospore. I mentioned to you before that we're concerned only about two. Uh, we're concerned with only two endospores, the bacillus and the clostridium strains. I also put the spore of Sar Sarcinia up here only because it's mentioned in the text. But for our purposes, we're only going to be interested in two endospores, bacillus and clostridium. Not all prokaryotes have the ability to become, to be endospores. But since I was showing a prokaryotic cell, I decided to go on and show you that um, this one may have the capacity to be an endospore if it were a bacillus or a clostridium, right? The importance of an endospore is that it can withstand hostile conditions and that will help facilitate survival. It'll become an endospore and it can stay as endospore state for centuries. We have some endospores that have been around since biblical times. So when they think, uh, when this bacteria thinks that uh, conditions are right for it to thrive, it will stop being an endospore and then it will go into vegetative state. Then and only then is it much easier to kill or destroy. We have some actin filaments here. Actin is important because it helps give the cell structure. It's really the cytoskeleton of uh, the prokaryotic cell. It contributes to the shape and structure of the cell. Here surrounding the whole cell is called the cell membrane. The cell membrane surrounds the cytoplasm. The stuff is floating in here. It provides a site for energy reactions, nutrient processing, and synthesis. The main job of the cell membrane is to transport nutrients into the cell and wastes out of the cell. I need you to understand that this cell membrane is selectively permeable. Some things can go out, but some things can come in. Selectively, it's selectively permeable. It regulates what goes in and out of it. Lastly, we have these things called inclusion bodies. Inclusion bodies stores nutrients. That's pretty much it uh, about a prokaryotic cell. 
It's not a really a lot going on in a prokaryotic cell, but it's still a very important uh, construction. Let's look at the cell wall. I know that we said this is the cell membrane. The cell membrane helps keep things in the, uh, keep the cytoplasm intact. No, a cell wall and a cell membrane comprise the cell envelope. The cell wall and the cell membrane make up the cell envelope. Let's look at the cell wall. We have cell wall, which is on the outside of this cell membrane. I didn't draw it, but the cell wall will be on the outside. We have gram-positive cell wall. Bacteria could be gram-positive or gram-negative if it's a gram stain, if it's a gram-positive or gram-negative at all. It could be other types too. It could be acid fast. It could be capsular. It can be a lot of these other things as well. But for our purposes right now, let's look at a cell wall. Gram-positive cell wall will be here, depicted here. Gram-negative cell, gram cell wall will be over here. The first thing we see sticking up in both of these cell walls, the gram-positive and the gram-negative, is a flagella. We remember flagella because we know that it helps with the motility, right? You can remember that. What's the importance of a cell wall? Let me just re remind you of that. The cell wall helps determine the shape of the bacterium. And it provides a structural support so that the bacteria will not burst or collapse due to osmotic pressure, due to osmotic pressure. We don't want the cell, we want the cell wall to be able to hold, withhold the uh, fluids inside and from outside the cell. So the cell wall helps uh, monitor osmotic pressure, make sure that the cell doesn't collapse on itself or burst, etc. That's the importance of a cell wall. The flagella, of course, here and here from the gram-positive bacteria and the gram-negative bacteria helps with motility. Here is a pilus here in the gram-negative and here's a pilus here, or pilus, in the gram positive. That can help with attachment. It can also help with attachment to other bacteria to transfer genetic material. So you can call that like a, almost like a um, sexual uh, encounter with this pilus attaching to another bacteria too transfer genetic material. It also helps for attachment when it wants to infect the host, right? We'll talk about that more, especially with um, E. coli in the uh, urinal genital tract. It can cause, it gets in there, it can stick and hold itself very firmly in the uh, uh, urinary tract and cause urinary tract infections. Here's a capsule here. Note the capsule here in the gram positive is here. The capsule in the gram negative is here. They're both about the same here. So far, the flagella, the pilus, and the capsules are looking the same in the gram negatives and gram positives, right? Capsules in some bacteria, not all bacteria have capsules. Take, for example, Klebsiella is a bacteria that has capsule, and it helps protect against phagocytosis. Capsules are important because they help prevent the bacteria from being eaten by our defense mechanisms, like our white blood cells. So they prevent phagocytosis. So that's very protective to a bacteria that has a capsule. That's going to be important for you to remember because you will be asked that question, the importance of a capsule. What will you say? You will say it helps prevent phagocytosis. That's very protective to the bacteria. Here's the outer membrane. Please note that the outer membrane is only seen in the gram negative here. But what I want you to notice here in the gram positive, all of this is the peptidoglycan. Look at this little narrow peptidoglycan in the gram negative. Very narrow. Peptidoglycan is very thick in the gram positive. What's the big deal with the peptidoglycan? Well, the peptidoglycan provides strength and stability to the bacteria. 
The gram positive have a large peptidoglycan in the cell wall. The gram negatives have a very narrow or small peptidoglycan in its cell wall. It does help with stability, although both are stable. The peptidoglycan is much more uh, prominent in the gram positives. That's going to be important to know when we talk about antibiotics. So you will know peptidoglycan is going to be a site that antibiotics will attack and break down the bacteria. That's going to be a good thing for us because then we'll be able to fight infection. At the very bottom, we have a cytoplasmic membrane here in the blue, cytoplasmic membrane here for the gram positive, and a cytoplasmic membrane here as well for the gram negative. Now, one thing you, so those aren't the same. One thing you may note in the gram negative are these spaces here. The space, this is called a periplasmic space. Please note that the periplasmic space is only seen in gram negatives. Anytime you see something special that's only seen in one thing and not the other, you know there's going to be a question about it. So remember that the periplasmic space is only seen in the gram negatives, and the peptidoglycan wall here in the gram positive is very thick as opposed to the very thin one in the gram negative. Okay? Cell wall and the cell membrane, those two things make up the cell envelope, okay? We will talk about cell envelopes. Uh, we'll talk about that later when we actually get into all the bacteria that you're going to learn. Now, we talked about cell shapes because, of course, this is a cell wall um, and the... Um, Every cell wall is different. So we have some shapes that look like this. This is, oh, this is called a rod. This is a rod shape, or we call shapes morphology as well. This one, circular, is a cocci or coccus. And then we have one that's kind of wiggly like that, and that's spirillia, right? Interesting enough, um, E. coli is one that is shaped like a rod. Sometimes they're a little shorter. They could be like that too. Uh, Staphylococcus aureus is round, like a, it's a coccus. And then you have spirillia or spirillia, and that's actually seen in a treponema uh, palladium, which is a bacteria that causes syphilis. So it looks kind of wiggly like that. Oh, another one that we could talk about, we aren't going to really see this curved one. It's a curved one. It's also called Vibrio. Vibrio. Like that. And uh, these things, we'll talk about how they undergo with their gram stain, right? So here we are with appendages. Appendages provide motility, like a flagella or axial filaments can also provide motility. Appendages are also able to provide attachments or channels. We'll see that with fembrae and as the one we talked about before, the pili will act as an attachment or and or it can be a channel to, ex to uh, exchange uh, genetic material. Prokaryotic flagellum rotate in a 360 degree um, manner like a propeller. So you remember that prokaryotic flagellum will rotate like a wheel going around and around or a propeller. Eukaryotic flagellum undulate. In other words, they move kind of back and forth. They can go this way or they can go this way. Kind of like the way um, a shark swims, I guess. Anyway, those are two differences in the way the uh, uh, flagella uh, move. The closest eukaryotic flagella I could think of 
is in sperm and sperm whips like this. It, un, it undulates, but the prokaryotic flagellum will go like this, okay? Let's look at some different flagella. So flagella um, attached at, can be attached at one end or at um, both ends. So here's flagellum attached at both ends. We call that polar. And then here's a flagellum attached at one end. All right, so flagellum can be attached at one end like this or at both ends. That's a polar type of flagellum. Here are the names of particular flagellum. And when you see the word like trichus, just think of it, it means like hair. So monotrichus, one little hair, one flagellum here. Uh, Lopotrichus, several flagellum coming out. And one end here, amphitrichus is at um, both ends, kind of. I guess you could say it's polar, but the word they use is amphitrichus. It is polar, though, as well. But use the word, use the word with the, um, the suffix of trichus in it. And then peritrichus means all the flagellum is all around. Peri means around, so all around this organism is our flagellum, so peritrichus. You need to remember um, what these different uh, flagella look like, and they have them in the book. These are just my depictions, and what word goes with each one. Because flagella is very important in how, why? Because it uh, gives the organism the ability to move, and motility is very important. Because it can go away from certain things it's trying to harm it, or go towards things that it needs, like for nutrients, right? Uh, when we're talking about the, the cell wall, I should have mentioned this, but I didn't. So here's the component. Here's how it compares from gram positive and gram negative. So I just made this little chart up. It should kind of go with the previous stuff I was talking about. Um, I was talking about the peptidoglycan, etc. But here's the peptidoglycan. Remember, it's a lot thicker in the gram positives and it's multi layered. And the gram negatives, the peptidoglycan cell wall is thinner and it's a single layer. Uh, uh, Tichoic acids are present in gram positives. They are not in gram negatives, so that will be something to remember, and we'll talk about why a little bit later. Lipopolysaccharides, they call it LPS, which LPS, LPS. How did I spell this other thing? Um, that uh, is not in gram positive, but it is indeed in gram negatives. So, so far, what do we have? Teochloric acid is in gram positives, but lipopolysaccharide is in gram negatives. Those two things you will have to be able to differentiate. And we will talk about that um, in the coming lecture. Um, what is this one? This doesn't look like it's. Hmm. I, I, I don't know what that one. Lipo. Lipoprotein acid. Okay, it's not in the gram positive, but it is in the gram negatives. And then phospholipids are not in the gram positive, but they are in the gram negatives. So gram negatives have a lot of things going on, and it um, it's easier probably to just remember the gram positive has teochloric acid, and then it doesn't have the other stuff. That if that will just make it easier for you to. Um, remember. So let's talk about pili. Once again, I'm going to go over that, reiterate it. The pili are utilized primarily in the mating process between cells, and that's known as conjugation. And what conjugation is, um, it transfers DNA from one cell to another. Another thing I wanted to say about uh, bacteria is that they can cause biofilms, and biofilms are like a glue, okay? These are microbes, this is living matter, matter that cling together in complex masses, just like you would say soap scum in your bathroom, or algae in swimming pools, uh, even plaque on your teeth. And we'll talk about some of these bacteria as we progress. Uh, when we start to really get into the bacteria right now, we're just going to talk about prokaryotes in a general term. 
I want you to know that they can cause biofilms, and biofilms are like glue. The importance of this is that they can accumulate and on damaged tissue, such as uh, heart valves. Um, a person has been previously stricken with um, rheumatic heart disease. Uh, they get into like foreign materials, such as catheters, uh, IUDs, intrauterine devices, IUDs, and artificial hip joints. So oftentimes we'll have these biofilms that are, they are sticky, they're bacteria, and they adhere especially to foreign objects. So you know the catheter when you're feeding it into the urethra to get a urine sample or, or to collect urine, um, it, you have to be all sterile, but supposed and the tube is kind of uh, wiry, and it might flip and it hits something, and you go, ah, it just get, hit something, and you feed it into the person. Well, that tube has just picked up a ton of bacteria, and now you're feeding it into the person's bladder. It should really remain sterile. If it hits something, or just even tap like that, if it hits something, then you need to just reglove up and get a new pack because that can really set up a UTI, uh, urinary uh, tract infection. Okay, so let's look at some different, some uh, bacterial structures here so we can know what we're talking about when we talk about bacteria. So here are the structures here, the function of each structure here, and then the chemical composition of each of the structures over here. So we talked about peptidoglycan pretty much at length. Um, you know it's quite thicker in the gram positives and a lot thinner in the gram negatives. What's its function? It's a rigid support. It's going to protect against osmotic pressure so water coming in and out of the cell can be modified. Uh, it's made of a sugar backbone with cross-linked peptide side chains. In other words, it's like a glycoprotein. Everything mainly is a sugar and a protein, a sugar and a pro protein, mostly. Um, let's look at the cell wall, the cell membrane, um, seen in uh, gram positives. Oops. It's a major surface antigen. Um, uh, remember, tichloic uh, acid induces fever and tissue breakdown. This is in a gram positive. We had tichloric acid, and I told you that we would come back and talk about what that does. Well, it produces fever and tissue breakdown. And remember, that's only seen in gram positives. Here we are with the, um, in gram positives, has tichloric acid. Um, the outer membrane seen in gram negatives only, the outer membrane seen in gram negatives. Um, is the site of endotoxin. Remember that lipopolysaccharide, okay? That is lipid A. It is the site, let's do it like that, oops. Oh well, it's kind of big. It induces fever and tissue breakdown. Um, lipopolysaccharide, LPS, with the lipid A induces uh, fever and uh, tissue breakdown for gram negatives. The major surface antigen for the gram negative uh, lipopolysaccharide is, of course, a polysaccharide. LPS is lipopolysaccharide. That lets, lets you know that the polysaccharide, this is many sugars, that is the main site that causes this, uh, induces this fever and tissue breakdown. Now, one thing I wanted to make clear is that not only, not just Gram positive have cell wall, and cell membrane. You know, gram positive and gram negatives both have cell walls and cell membranes. But the point here with saying this gram positive is I want you to relate it to the tichloric acid. Not that uh, gram negatives don't have cell walls and cell membranes, they do. But in this case, the gram, the gram positive cell wall and cell membrane contains the tichloric acid, and it's the cause of fever and tissue breakdown. And that would be the major surface antigen in that case. Whereas in the outer membrane, only gram negatives have that, and its major surface antigen would be the polysaccharide. 
the thing that's causing the problem uh, for the host. Um, plasma membrane, this is the site of oxidative transport um, in the lipo uh, protein bilayer. Ribosome, as we've, talked, as we've talked about for bacterial structures, is the site of protein synthesis. The big deal with this is that, of course, it's RNA and protein. And the prokaryote is 50S and 30S subunits. Um, we're going to come back and talk more about those ribosomes. Um, well, okay, let's just talk about them now. So in the prokaryote, it's... Uh, but they're in 50S and 30S subunits in the prokaryote, but it comes out to be a 70S. Uh, so we'll have like a 50S here sitting on a smaller 30S, and this is for prokaryote, right? It's measured with this S because this guy named Svedberg, it's a measurement it's a, it's, a, it's a unit of measurement, not the actual, like if you were add this 50 plus 30, you know you would come up with 80, but it's not that these are added. These are units of measurement. So anyway, prokaryotes are 70S, whereas eukaryotes are 80S. And it, so that, that's the difference. So this is a prokaryote, and... Should I show you the eukaryote? Should I just draw a eukaryote just so you remember? Uh, 60S uh, and a 40S for eukaryote. Um, and this comes out to be 80S. So we're 80S. This is eukaryotes. Just so you know. And this is prokaryotes. Okay? And that difference in those ribosomes and that protein synthesis makes all the difference because we have some um, site of action of antibiotics, say like aminoglycosides or erythromycin, tetracyclines and chloramphenicol will act on this 70S, destroy it, and when a bacteria doesn't have any more protein, it can no longer exist. So we do have antibiotics that will work on the 70S, kill this bacteria, but because we are 80S, it will not harm our tissues, and that's how we can use antibiotics to kill bacteria, but keep us still safe and strong and get us out of being ill. So it won't attack the 80S, but it will attack the 70S, and that is a major way that we use quite a few antibiotics, the few that I mentioned. Aminoglycosides, erythromycins, uh, tetracyclines, and chlorophenicol. So that's a big deal with the ribosomes and the protein synthesis. The difference is what um, antibiotics can attack, okay? Let's look at the nucleoid. This uh, participates, in, oh, oh, this is on um, genetic material. It's the, where the DNA is in the uh, prokaryote. Remember, it's not encased. It's just kind of loose in the center of the cell. Mesosomes participates in cell division. Um, it's an invagination or invagination of the plasma membrane. Pulls itself in. Periplasma, remember, that's only seen in gram negatives. This is the space between the cytoplasmic membrane and the outer membrane. We drew that picture before of a cell wall, so you can go back to that or, of course, consult your text. The interesting thing about the periplasmic uh, space or membrane is that it contains hydrolytic enzymes, including beta-lactamases that break down penicillin. So these gram, this would be gram negatives. In that general area where the periplasmic space is, they contain enzymes that are harmful to antibiotics, such as uh, penicillin. Because it's a beta-lactamase in there, that enzyme will break down penicillin. So you're trying to kill a bacteria by taking penicillin, but the bacteria has a beta-lactamase in it, getting rid of that and harming the, the antibiotic, which is quite uh, interesting. 
capsule. We talked about a capsule on bacteria before. Remember that it protects against phagocytosis. It protects the bacteria from being eaten by our cells, trying to get rid of it. It's a polysaccharide, except in, like, what is this? That is not protects against phagocytosis capsule polysaccharide, except in Bacillus anthrax. I don't know why that is there, because Bacillus doesn't have a capsule. So just remember that the capsule, this is what I'm going to say for this, is that the capsule protects against phagocytosis, and it is made out of a poly, uh, polysaccharide. Let's just leave it at that. Uh, pilus or pilus or fimbria uh, mediates adherence to the bacteria, cell surface, and attachment of bacteria during conjugation, which we just talked about, it, the organisms having uh, exchange of genetic material. That's going to be a glycoprotein uh, flagellum. We just talked about that. Of course, that's uh, interested in uh, motility. That's going to be a protein. Everything's going to be a sugar protein, sugar protein. Glyco meaning sugar protein, meaning of course protein. Spore, that's going to add to durability of the bacteria. Um, provides resistance to dehydration, um, heat, and other chemicals. That's what a spore form will do. Of course, it's a keratin-like coat, a diplocanic acid. And we know the two spore formers are bacillus and clostridium. Please remember that. Plasmid is really a circular piece of DNA. It contains a variety of genes for antibiotic resistance, enzymes, and toxins. Plasmids are really special, and they will transfer to other bacteria to help them to survive as well. Very um, resistant to antibiotics and other enzymes. That's made out of DNA. Um, we'll talk later about how we are able to use plasmids to make other things uh, the way we want that bacteria to be. We can uh, engineer it. Glycocalyx, this mediates adherence to surfaces, especially foreign surfaces um, like indwelling catheters. This is just another word for biofilms, glycocalyx, and of course is a sugar polysaccharide. So, with this is just the biofilm that um, we mentioned previously. It's made by Dr. Caleb. So that is um, pretty much it about concerning the actual structure of the bacterium. I'm going to next go into some gram stain limitations. These bacteria that I'm going to talk about do not gram stain well. And then I'm going to um, tell you about some other gram stains that do um, a little bit better. Um, the thing I want you to remember before, before I forget is the endospores produced by um, vegetative cells during unfavorable conditions. Remember that's bacillus and clostridium. I said that a million times. The flagella, please know that you need to know that how to describe the structure and how it generates motility, how the, it generates cell motility. So please look at the structure of the flagellum in the text and make sure you understand that. And the capsule protects bacteria from antibiotics, uh, antibodies, antimicrobials, and of course, phagocytosis. So remember the importance of a capsule. Um, I want you to make sure you go over the, uh, knowing the steps of the gram stain and um, I will show you later how to do a quadrant streak, okay? But the next thing we're gonna talk about is gram stain limitation. So it pretty much summed it up about the um, prokaryotic as a cell. The rest of it, you can kind of go through the text and get more um, filler information. I just want to go over the general theme of that chapter so that when you're reading through it or, and looking at the pictures and the captions, that you can understand it. 
Um, here are some gram stain uh, limitations. I know we haven't done gram staining yet, but we will. I want you to have this in your notes. So these things don't gram stain very well. These don't gram stain well. So a tryponema, um, they're too thin to be visualized, so you need a special kind of uh, microscopy for that. You need a dark field microscope and a fluorescent antibody stain, not particularly a gram stain, okay? And where did we say that we saw this uh, little uh, bacteria from? Um, a squiggly, like a spiral. Well, we saw that with syphilis, right? Tryponema. Uh, Rickettsia is an intracellular parasite. So it gets in the cells, lives off the cells. Um, it does a gram stain very well. Mycobacterium has a high lipid content, so a high fat content. Um, I want you to remember this mycolic acid is in the cell walls and that is a fat and it helps um, actually make the bacteria resistant to antibiotics. So this uh, mycobacterium actually causes tuberculosis and leprosy and that's why you have to take so many a couple of antibiotics or one antibiotic and a couple of other things with an, an over a six month period, sometimes a year or more, um, to kill uh, uh, tuberculosis, mycobacterium tuberculosis, because uh, um, of this high lipid content, this mycolic acid that's in the cell wall. Remember that mycolic acid in the cell wall. The cell wall requires an acid fast stain. So when you, we do an acid fast stain, it's probably going to be on a mycobacterium. Mycoplasma, not the same, not the same. This one's mycobacteria, this one's mycoplasma. Mycoplasma has no cell wall. We see mycoplasma in uh, something called the uh, walking pneumonia. A lot of people around your age will get that. Younger people, middle, um, yeah, like younger people get that, the walking pneumonia. It's caused by this bacteria, mycoplasma. It doesn't have a cell wall, so of course that's going to make it difficult to gram stain. Let's talk about Legionella. Legionella requires a silver stain. Um, this stays mainly in like water, kind of water areas, like air conditioners, and things like that. We'll talk a little bit more about Legionella when we get to the actual bacteria, and we'll talk about Legionnaires' uh, disease and Legionnaire, Legionella pneumoniae. Uh, in this big conference in Philadelphia, we'll talk about that later, how they turned on the air conditioning and all these older gentlemen, um, they were gentlemen, but all these older guys ended up with pneumonia. So that doesn't gram stain well, it requires a silver stain. Chlamydia, chlamydia is also an intracellular parasite, just like Rickettsia, and it does not gram stain well, and uh, chlamydia can cause uh, blindness and problems with the eye, and of course it's also can be a sexually transmitted disease. Um, so these are the ones that don't gram stain well. Let's take a look at the pigment producing bacteria here, just the pigment producing bacteria. Staphylococcus aureus here, aureus, this AU, that means gold on the uh, periodic chart, it will produce a yellow pigment, okay? Pseudomonas aeruginosa produces a beautiful bluish green pigment. We see Pseudomonas aeruginosa a lot with uh, patients that have uh, cystic fibrosis. We see Pseudomonas aeruginosa with people that have burns or wounds. And it's a beautiful kind of bluish green color when you see it, that bacteria. Serratia marcescens is a red pigment. They did something interesting with serratia marcescens. They actually were testing the current, the wind current of the uh, United States, and they would put this uh, pretty much benign type of bacteria in the air and try to trace it as the wind currents, the trade winds in the country. And it's kind of crazy to put bacteria in the air to check that out, but they did that. Uh, Micrococcus luteus. Micrococcus luteus is a bright yellow. Now this is kind of like a staph aureus is like a golden yellow and Micrococcus luteus is a bright yellow. So these are pigmented producing um, bacteria. 
Other thing I want to do is just go through briefly so that you will know which bacteria are gram positive and which ones are gram negative. This is kind of getting you ready for uh, lab practical. Please keep these, um, I hope, I hope that you are taking notes when I'm giving these lectures. But you need to take this down and make sure that you understand it. So staph aureus is going to be gram positive. I'll just put gram positive there. Pseudomonas originosa is gram negative. Serratia marcescens is gram negative. Uh, Micrococcus luteus is gram positive. Uh, Mycobacterium spagmatis is acid fast, but I think it's a gram positive, and I'll just put acid fast, not too much of a gram, whatever. Escherichia coli is gram negative. Proteus vulgaris is gram negative. And Bacillus uh, magnetarium is gram positive, okay? So I want you to um, remember these uh, gram stains, but yeah, you know, we said that doesn't gram stain very well. But anyway, I just want you to remember those because these are the bacteria that you're going to need to be um, familiar with. Okay. So that about does it for chapter four. Make sure you read the questions at the end and, and also go over the summary at the end of each of the chapters. They help sum it up really well and it will go over what your notes uh, say too. So I hope you're taking notes. The next thing we're gonna do, um, I'll see you again when we go over chapter five, and that will be talking about the eukaryotes, and that's where we are, and some plants, and some algae, and other animals, and we'll um, compare and contrast the prokaryotes, with, which are bacteria, that do not have a nucleus to the eukaryotes where we belong that have a nucleus. Okay, that'll be in chapter five. So I'll see you in chapter five next time.